It's 2018, December 23rd. My name's Hilary Jacobson. My parrot's name is Dulcinea. And I'm going to read to you from a book written by Herbert Muller, in 19, published in 1952, called The Uses of the Past, Profiles of Former Societies. And I've been reading this chapter called The Rise of Christianity. One, the varieties of Christian experience, and this theme is very apropos for the Christmas season. Although no Christian, I suppose, would deny that Christianity has had a history, few seem really aware of the implications of this truism. Believers naturally tend to assume that their beliefs are the immutable truths revealed or discovered by the founder of their religion. So St. Vincent of Lorraine described Catholicism as what all men have believed everywhere and always. Protestant sectarians believe that they have returned to the true faith which was corrupted by Catholicism. Liberal Christians assume that all the diverse sects have had the same basic faith, which is unfortunately obscured by the wrangling over detail all overlook the profound changes that have taken place throughout Christian history and the profound divisions in any given period. As the epistles of St. Paul reveal, the earliest followers of Jesus disagreed sharply over his teachings. There were some 20 varieties of Christianity by the 2nd century and at least 80 by the 4th century. The Church Fathers entertained beliefs that are heretical by medieval standards and naive by modern standards. Today, most educated Christians entertain beliefs that would have bewildered or shocked St. Paul and made them eligible for burning in medieval Rome or Calvin's Geneva. The individual believer, accordingly, will continue to find the true meaning of Christianity in his own conception of the highest Christian ideals. So just repeat that. The individual believer, that's down to the level of the person now, will continue to find the true meaning of Christianity in his own conception of the highest Christian ideals. To the charge that Christianity has failed, he may then answer that it has never been tried. But this could be said as well of all the higher religions and philosophies. Meanwhile, we must consider not only the various ideals preached in the name of Christ, but the actual behavior of Christian churches and societies from which a detached observer might not deduce those ideals. The historic meaning of Christianity as an established religion lies not in its origins or in its choicest expressions, but in its entire history. All the thought, feeling, and conduct that it has inspired and failed to inspire. And this history, like that of all other institutions, is wonderfully and woefully mixed. It is shot through with absurd, sublime, and tragic contradictions of hope and fear, love and hatred, ecstasy and atrocity. The plainest reason for The plainest reason for a survey of this history is that Christianity has been the avowed basis of Western culture, the frame of reference for even its unchristian and anti-Christian developments. It produced Voltaire, Huxley, and Nietzsche, as well as Dante, <coughs> Milton, and Newton. But a survey is equally pertinent today because of the swelling chorus of voices in the wilderness crying that we can hope to save our civilization only by returning to a faith in God. No one is saying that any old faith will do. So the question is, what faith? What God? No Westerner is arguing for a return to the Orthodox faith, faith of St. Sophia, though this would seem to be as valid a choice as Roman Catholicism and the many varieties of Protestantism. And underlying these sectarian differences are still more fundamental differences in concepts of God and the good life. The Christian tradition includes a greater variety of conflicting traditions than any other high religion. 
<clears throat> what do you think, Dulcin? Hey, is that true? Yeah, I think so. Specifically, are we to return to a stern, inscrutable God in fear? Or to a loving, lawful God in joy? May we approach him through reason, believing that religious truth may be beyond re reason, but not necessarily contradictory to it? Or must we accept him on faith and distrust the claims of reason as sinful pride? Is the kingdom of God within us, in the eternal present, sufficient unto itself? Or must we expect literal heaven and hell? And if there is a hereafter, may all men achieve salvation simply by being good? Or does salvation require correct opinions about God in the ministry of a church? <clears throat> to a sophisticated generation, such questions may seem academic, though in Christian history they have literally been burning issues. Other questions, however, make a vital difference in everyday life. <clears throat> Is the world as God's creation a blessing to be used, enjoyed, made the most of, or a devil's snare to be contended against, or a veil of tears to be escaped? Should we guard against a fugitive and cloistered virtue, or should we guard against attachment to the world and temporal interests? Is the body the prison of the soul, the vile flesh, the antithesis of spirit? Or are body and soul inseparable and ideally a harmonious whole? Should we love all men, refrain from all violence, and resist not evil? Or should we hate God's enemies and war on evil? Should we judge or judge not? Should we concentrate on saving our society? Or our souls. Historic Christianity has given contradictory answers to all these questions. Rationalism and fideism, monism and dualism, optimism and pessimism, worldliness and otherworldliness, mildness and militancy all have been embraced by the most flexible of religions, while it proclaimed its inflexible devotion to its immutable truths. This diversity is a sign of the vitality of Christianity, which has been able to survive profound changes, adapting itself to good times and bad, accommodating new knowledge and new aspirations. The diversity is also an obvious source of confusion and conflict. It helps to explain why Christianity has never succeeded in stamping a society as indelibly as has Judaism, uh, Mohammedism, and Confucianism. At any rate, here is the historic meaning or welter of meanings that we must consider before we commit ourselves to programs for salvation. The historians of civilization have made this issue still more pertinent. Spengler pointed out that civilizations in decline have typically been marked by a second religiousness. In disillusionment and despair, they seek to recapture the vital faith of the ancestors or to manufacture some synthetic substitute. In Spengler's view, accordingly, the symptoms of such religiousness today would signify the beginning of the end, the hopelessness of salvation. Toyin B, once more, gives a different meaning to much the same picture. Although he notes that, that disintegrating societies are given to archaism or futile efforts to revive the dead past, he prefers to describe the new religiousness as transcendence or transfiguration. The dying society gives birth to a higher religion, a truer conception of the one true God. In some of his recent essays, Toynbee speculates that the great drama of the future may be the counteraction of Islam in the Far East upon Western civilization, which presumably would give rise to a still higher religion, incorporating the best of Christianity and the Oriental religions, and perhaps arriving at some new conceptions. Remember, this was published in 1952. 
before um, Eastern religions began to be well known in the West. But generally, Toynbee argues that the Christian God is the one true God. If so, Christianity should be the spiritual heir of all other religions, and one secular Western civilization, which has given it the whole world to spread over, has reason to hope for a reprieve if it returns to its original faith. Once the true God is known to all mankind, his purposes might not demand the continued destruction of civilizations. I'm going to read that paragraph over. It's very, I think, pertinent for what's going on today. So we have this attempt to revitalize um, the foundational religion, which of the Western society would be Christianity. Christianity would be the spiritual heir of all the other religions, and one secular Western civilization, that's us, which has given it the whole world to spread over, which we have, we have westernized the whole world, has reason to hope for a reprieve. Does that mean for kind of forgiveness for our sins on the world? If it returns to its original faith. So this might be the hope behind the revitalization of uh, spirituality or religiousness in the West that's kind of happening today to some extent. Once the true God is known to all mankind, the Christian God, this means, the purposes of Western civilization might not demand the continued destruction of civilizations. Just horrible. Okay, whew, that's heavy to really even begin to get bind, bend your mind around what he means. To a detached observer, the strongest argument for this possibly arrogant assumption that Christianity is the apex of spiritual progress is an argument that Toynbee does not press. As the last great product of the ancient world, Christianity was a synthesis of Jewish, Oriental, Greek, and Roman thought and feeling. When it converted the lusty Germanic peoples and became the faith of a rising civilization, it ceased to be primarily an end-of-the-world religion and in recent centuries it has been adapting itself, however tardily and painfully, to the consequences of the political, scientific, and industrial revolutions. Hence it is potentially capable of the further growth and change that would be required of a really universal religion in a going society. In this view, of course, one cannot speak confidently of the nature of the one true God or the religion of the future, but one may at least hope to assess more realistically the possibilities of Christianity as an agent of salvation for our civilization or as an inheritor of the remnants of our civilization, which form the values of the next civilization. Cold War. Talking about life during the years of the Cold War. Okay. From any point of view, the birth and growth of Christianity is among the most momentous dramas in history, as well as the most fascinating. The immediate question is how and why it triumphed. It had rich soil made fertile by the decay of the ancient religions of Greece and Rome, and by the uprooting of masses of people. But for the same reason, it might have been choked out by the mystery cults that were growing like weeds all over the Roman Empire. The answer is not simple, nor is simply edifying. We may concentrate, however, on the four major factors, apart from the heritage of Judaism, that distinguish Christianity from other popular mysteries. These are the figure of Jesus as man and as Christ, the contribution of St. Paul, the greatest of apostles, the development of a theology which made the new religion philosophically respectable, and the organization of a church on the Roman imperial model, which made it powerful. We may then consider the fortuitous contribution of the Emperor Constantine, whom the Church had reason to call the equal of the Apostles. His conversion to a despised minority sect in 395 AD uh, enabled it to become the imperial religion. Finally, we may consider the consequences of this triumph. What the Church won and lost, 
and with the masses brought with them as they were led or driven into it. Altogether, we may read an epical success story, but even for religious purposes, we might do well to read it in the tragic spirit, aware that its happy ending was also an unhappy beginning, and that in affairs of the spirit, nothing fails like worldly success. Two, the historic Jesus. The light's going out here. I'm going to <clears throat> put on a pair of glasses so I can read it a little bit more easy, easier. It's uh, getting a little dark in here. When Jesus went about his father's business in the temple, his parents did not understand him, yet we too are still mystified. So what would that have been? Would that have been when he was 12 years old and he... He entered the temple in Jerusalem and began to talk to the, the elders and became engaged with them in deep Jewish philosophy. And he said, I'm about my father's business. And his parents did not know what, was, what the heck was going on. Okay. The pious, painstaking efforts to recover the historic Jesus, on which scholars have been engaged for more than a century, have revealed how astonishingly little we know for certain about the human life of our Lord. Insofar as his gospel seems clear, they have revealed that it was, in fundamental respects, quite different from the religion that grew up in his name. And they have revealed a prophet who in still other respects is a stranger to us, an unsophisticated villager from an alien world. Of the meager, conflicting biographical data recorded in the Gospels, the birth of Jesus will do as an example. No one knows, of course, the exact date when he was born. Against the opposition of the East where he had lived, the Western churches elected the 25th of December, because of pagan tradition, it was a festival day that marked the winter solstice through an astronomical miscalculation and was therefore holy to the sun god, especially to Mithra, who was the chief rival as Christ to Christ as a savior god. The Mithra cult, that was another cult that was quite popular at that time. As for the details of the birth, we have our choice of the idyllic story of Luke, with the shepherds in the manger, or the grim story of Matthew, with the slaughter of the innocents and the flight to Egypt. The most significant detail in which these two authors agree is that he was born of a virgin, a detail unmentioned by Mark or John, and foreign to he Hebrew tradition. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, reads the prophecy of Isaiah in the King James Bible, Modern scholars, however, substantiate the protests of the early Jewish opponents of Christianity that the word, the word translated as virgin meant only a young woman in Hebrew and that the whole legend of the virgin birth closely resembled the tall stories of the foolish Greeks who invented such an origin for Plato, Pythagoras, Alexander, and other heroes. Matthew's story in particular is similar to the legend of Plato, born of a virgin by Apollo. Some early Christians preferred the theory of adoptionism implicit in the gospel according to Mark, who says nothing of the birth and has the spirit descending upon Jesus after he was baptized by John. In this view, Jesus was born a man, but earned divinity for his, by his spiritual achievement, thereby setting a still higher example for other men. That was a footnote. Let's go on. Such scanty records are not really astonishing. The early Christians were not interested in the human life of Jesus or the anniversary of his birth. They were interested primarily in his resurrection, on which they staked their whole hope of salvation. If Christ be not risen, insisted St. Paul, then is our preaching vain and is our, your faith also vain? 
Without this belief, there would have been no Christianity, and with its rise, Jesus disappeared from view, leaving only a few scattered memories that were colored by the faith in the risen Christ. Even the teachings of Christ involve considerable uncertainty. The Gospels preserve only fragments of his many discourses. All that is recorded could be said in a few hours, and we cannot be sure that their selection or emphasis is fairly representative. They are interpretations of his message in the light of ideas that grew up after his death. The New Testament was the product of the early churches, not their basis. When Protestantism sought to return to the Bible, it returned to doctrines that were not certainly taught by Jesus himself. Although some scholars have therefore questioned even the existence of Jesus, this extreme skepticism seems unwarranted. Certain details of the gospel narratives impress one as unquestionably authentic. For example, the misunderstanding of his family, the denial of Peter, and the flight of the apostles, because they are scarcely the kind of detail that would be invented to glorify the Christ. The last words of Jesus on the cross, as reported by Mark and Matthew, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? give an especially poignant sense of the human tragedy of Jesus the physical and spiritual anguish, the final loneliness, the terrible suspicion that this miss- his, miss- his mission has been a failure. The gentle Luke has the dying Jesus say, Father, into thy hands I commend thy- my spirit. John, who makes Jesus aware of his fate from beginning to end, reports a simple, It is finished. In spite of all their discrepancies, moreover, The Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke give so similar an impression of Jesus that they are rightly known as the Synoptic Gospels. They picture an inspired missionary who was not profoundly original in his thought, but who had a singular sweetness of spirit, a radiant simplicity, and breadth of humanity that welcomed the publicans and sinners despised by Pharisees and Greeks alike. They present the basic teaching that has been the main source of Christian idealism and which remains as noble an inspiration as religion has offered. This teaching, to repeat, is essentially that of the great prophets of Israel, but it is pure in Jesus. He was still more indifferent to the external forms of religion. He deepened the inwardness of the prophets in his teaching that the kingdom of God is within men and above all, worldly fortunes and misfortunes. Yes, the kingdom of God is within men, and above all, worldly fortunes and misfortunes. A very simple idea that remains the essential spiritual insight. Likewise, he was freer from prejudice and more clearly exemplified the ideal of universalism. The neighbor to be loved was not only the good Jew, but the sinner and the heathen Samaritan. Nothing in religious history surpasses the sentiment attributed to him at the crucifixion. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Altogether, his deceptively simple gospel of universal brotherhood and love was so revolutionary that it has taken Christians so many centuries to realize its implications and merely to begin to affect them in political and economic life. Yet the synoptic Gospels also make clear that Jesus did not conceive himself as the revolutionary author of a new world religion, and in a real sense was not the founder of Christianity. According to these Gospels, he made no plain, open claim to divinity. They suggest that he he came to regard himself as the Messiah, though he never boasted of the divinic ancestry that Luke and Matthew are at pains to give him. But even if he had publicly adopted this role, instead of requesting his disciples to keep it a secret, his listeners would not have assumed his divinity. The Messiah of tradition was not the Son of God. In any case, he did not offer salvation through a redeeming Lord. He taught, rather, that through repentance and righteousness, any man could earn the kingdom of heaven by his own efforts. Then the church went on to make him the equal of God and to insist that salvation was possible only through Christ. The central doctrine of Christianity became the doctrine of the Incarnation, 
which was apparently unknown to Jesus and his first followers. The doctrine of the incarnation, I don't know what that is. Similarly, the recorded teaching of Jesus was not cultish. In other words, he didn't build any kind of secret organization around himself. He did not baptize or prescribe baptism as essential. His institution of the Eucharist, as described in the gospel, suggests a simple memorial with no magical efficacy. The Eucharist is when um, they sat down to Passover and he um, broke apart the, the bread and gave it to them, saying, Remember me when you thus come together to eat the bread and drink the wine. Remember that it's my body and my blood. It is as if you are eating my body and blood. Remember, you are imbibing. When you eat, you are imbibing life itself, and in that life itself is me. That's how I understand it. So, um, he's in, uh, the, the Eucharist, as described in the Gospel, suggests a s simple memorial with no magical efficacy. In other words, he wasn't saying, it is actually the, my body and blood. It doesn't turn into my body and blood. <laughs> Constantly, he attacked the formalism of the high priests and the scribes, the blind guides who strained at a gnat and swallowed a camel. Be not ye called rabbi, rabbi, he told his disciples, because only one was their master, and they were all brethren. Then the church made the sacraments necessary to salvation after the fashion of other mystery cults, and presently was fined, was embarrassed to find that the devil had instituted the rite of communion in Mithraism so as to mislead simple Christians. So in other words, I say, the, the church created baptism and the Eucharist and other things and said, you have to do this to be saved. And then they were embarrassed to find out that um, similar rites had been instituted into Mithraism. And they said it had been done so as to mislead simple Christians, even though they themselves had adopted the 25th of December is the birth of Christ, and they had stolen that from Mithraism. So back and forth, back and forth. Okay. So um, all of this developed an autocratic priesthood, an elaborate hierarchy of masters, and through them alone were the brethren permitted to come to Christ. In time, Christianity was torn by fierce wrangling over the letter of the new law, the formalism that Jesus despised. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. And he was saying, it's not the commandments of men that are my doctrines. It's that the kingdom of God is within you, and love your brother as yourself. Okay. In general, the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels would have been mystified or appalled by many of the doctrines through which his father's business came to be interpreted and conducted. So the apparent moral is that we might try to recover the gospel that has been buried under layer upon layer of ritual and dogmas. Actually, the moral is not so simple. As we recover the historic Jesus, we find not merely an elevated prophet, but an unlettered Galilean who shows little trace of the culture of the ancient world and who hardly foresaw the peculiar problems of the modern world. We are forced to reinterpret and readopt his teaching, precisely as the early church was forced to do. Among other things, Jesus seems to have accepted the popular superstitions of his time and place. Mark has him forever casting out devils, the evil spirits that were supposedly the cause of disease. Most of his recorded mir miracles were of this kind, which was a routine performance for contemporary wonder workers. Similarly, Jesus is credited with the popular apocalyptic visions and with the belief in hell, a furnace of fire, which the Israelites had apparently learned, learned about during their captivity. Such notions may be spiritualized, well, that means they may be abstracted, as they have been, but in the Gospels they are presented as bald matters of fact. There is heaven, there is hell. There is a devil, the hell is fire, and disease is called by by um, bad spirits. So that's a matter of fact. Today we look at the, all of those things more abstractly as archetypes. So um, these facts are hardly consistent with the disinterested love of God and man that Jesus also taught. 
Neither can the historic Jesus clarify our conceptions of God. He had no theology, made no pretense of offering new ideas about God. All his allusions imply a personal God, but he felt no necessity to describe or explain him. For this was the God his lowly listeners already knew. He cannot answer such questions as why a perfect God created so imperfect a world, because these questions never occurred to him. The recorded faith of Jesus had indeed a childlike quality. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein, is a quote from Jesus. And he meant with a childlike spirit, or at least that's how it's been interpreted. And he thanked God because thou hast, be, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. And his more specific religious ideas are generally more troublesome. If he conceived himself as the Messiah, the conception is ambiguous. It may have been as the Davidic prince of popular conception, or as the son of man mentioned in Daniel and Enoch, but neither conception is strictly acceptable or even intelligible to the modern mind. So he was not the Messiah. He is not the Davidic prince or the son of man. The indifference of Jesus to the wise and prudent was ultimately an indifference to the whole effort of civilization. He was not, to be sure, an ascetic. He appears to have taken pleasure in nature, wine, and other simple joys. He told his disciples to be not as the Pharisees of a sad countenance. He wanted them to have a life more abundantly. Nevertheless, the perfect world he proclaimed was not so much a com completion of human effort in this world as an epilogue, a supernatural kingdom that required the end of the natural world. Hence, we have trouble even with the ethical teaching of Jesus, the sublime sermons on the Mount itself. Almost all Westerners, including agnostics, revere this teaching. Almost none, including the most orthodox Christians, really believe its plain injunctions of non-attachment and non-violence. And since Jesus himself sometimes acted in a different spirit, as when he drove the money changers out of the temple, we might look at the historic setting in which he preached, again remembering that he was preaching to his fellow Jews and not to all mankind. Palestine had long been convulsed by fierce struggles against the heathen oppressors of Israel. The, per <laughs> the period of Jesus was one of almost hysterical tension, reflected in the many nervous maladies he cured by casting out demons and in the extensive apocalyptic literature. It has therefore been suggested that in commanding non-resistance to evil, Jesus was opposing the zealots, the party that refused to pay taxes to Caesar, clamored for open rebellion against the Romans, and was especially popular in his own Galilee. Presumably, Jesus foresaw the hopelessness of this struggle, which in fact led to the destruction of Jerusalem. If so, his ethical teaching was not revolutionary, but conservative and prudent. And this might also explain the popular revulsion against Jesus. The people wanted above all to be delivered from the Romans, and he told them to render unto Caesar the things that were Caesar's. Another, more comprehensive explanation of the Sermon on the Mount was it, the popular expectation that the kingdom of God was at hand. Just what Jesus himself meant by the kingdom is not clear. Some of his reported sayings plainly indicate a spiritual kingdom, one not of this earth or one that is within you. Other sayings, as plainly, indicate an imminent kingdom on this earth, in keeping with the whole prophetic tradition of Israel. Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. But there is no question that the early followers of Jesus, including those who preserved or imagined the sayings now found in the Gospels, I'll call the impression that the kingdom was coming any day. As St. Paul 
announced the time is short, and given this expectation, the ethical teaching of Jesus is not at all impractical. Laying up treasure on earth, resisting evil, hating enemies, keeping the eye that offends you, taking thought of the morrow, all such activities, which are important enough of society as a going business, become, a trivial or irre- become trivial or irrelevant if the morrow is to bring the kingdom of heaven. This would further explain the very fragmentary records of his career. As Guinbert remarks, the disciples would hardly be interested in remembering and preserving for the future the details of a teaching which interested them precisely because it limited the future to a few months. And we might be less troubled by the harsh sayings attributed to Jesus, such otherwise inhuman injunctions as to leave the Father and let the dead bury their dead, or even to sever all family ties and hate parents, brethren, wife, and children. So when I read this a uh, little bit here, and I'll repeat it, because they believed that the end was nigh and that their salvation was in loving and following the teachings of Jesus, which they, however, did not bother to put to paper because they thought it wasn't worth it since the world was ending anyway, that they therefore believed that it was a good idea to separate yourself from your family and sever all ties and follow Jesus, as he said. And as I read this, I was reminded that this is what people believe who are in all cults. This is a very cultic saying. I was actually present uh, in the back of a cult. Um, well, anyway, I was a, I was a member of Ananda Marga but I, I didn't know what it was all about. I had just joined to do the yoga. And was sitting in the back of a um, of a men's kind of monastery um, one time and heard them saying exactly these things to the boys. When you go home from Christmas, remember, this is not your real family. They're going to try to delude you, to pull you in, keep yourself innerly separate from them. And, um, you know, if you ever get um, involved in something that tells you to discount the values of family, chances are you've encountered something cult-like. Okay, we would then be led to the ironic conclusion that Christian ethics and the establishment of the Christian church resulted from the failure of our Lord's vision. So the failure of our Lord's vision, the proof of that is the development of the Christian church. So this possible illumination of his extremism, his extremism, leave your family, etc., presumably will not be welcomed in orthodox quarters, even though they will continue just to discount his principles. For the unorthodox, no, 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 to love your enemy as yourself, that's right, and to look for the kingdom inside of yourself and not outside through power. We would then be led to the ironic conclusion that the Christian ethics and the establishment of the Christian church resulted from the failure of our Lord's vision. So this possible illumination, this possible illumination in this book of his extremism, presumably will not be welcomed in orthodox quarters, even though they will continue to discount his principles. For the unorthodox, there are two ways of looking at ideals that are admittedly impossible of realization in a solvent society. And I love that he says, in a solvent society. In other words, if you have a society that is succeeding and is solvent, it's not bankrupt, it's not going downhill fast, um, you can still somehow um, look at his Christ's ideals in two ways that w- will not um, destroy your society. White had rejoiced in the fortunate ignorance of the gospel authors who could give free rein to their vision of ideal possibilities without regard for such practical considerations as the preservation of society. In the long run, society may profit more from such visions of the pure ideal and more nearly realize the ideal he hoped. On the other hand, Arthur Murphy maintains that an idealism that is too good for this world is simply not good enough since it neglects the social conditions under which real goods and real evils are produced. 
<sighs> the demand for universal love may be the, the, the demand for universal love. And this is what we have on the left today, on the far left. Everybody, <clears throat> we should universally love everyone. Everybody should get things um, equally. The demand for universal love may be the distinction essential to the good life and perhaps higher principle of loving only the lovable and hating the vile. So it's a higher universal love is a higher principle than only loving the good and hating the evil. And the condemnation of all use of force and as necessary evil obscures the actual necessity of using force to prevent greater evil. So this last paragraph, I'm not going to pretend to understand, but it seems like he's saying that um, that scholars of politics and society are saying that we are better off for having Christian ideals to live up to in the background of our minds, even though it's full of contradictions and impossibilities for the way that it can't really guide many of our choices in the world. Because, for instance, if we don't resist evil, we might allow evil to become greater. Okay. At any rate, it was not the Sermon on the Mount that conquered the world. The ruling ethics of Christianity has not only more... Yeah, not too much more, actually. Oh, just another page and a half. What do you think, Dulcie? Are we getting smarter? Hmm? Do we know more now? Okay. At any rate, it was not the Sermon on the Mount that conquered the world. The love thy neighbor as yourself, and um, the meek shall inherit the world, earth. The ruling ethics of Christianity has been not only more worldly in practice, but more militant in principle. If St. Francis of Assisi is the typical, is the ideal type of Christian, and he was, you know, Francis of Assisi, that was a group of priests who embraced poverty and they actually gave up all their worldly goods and they traveled throughout Europe um, joining those who were living on the street, you know, in abysmal poverty, joining them and preaching the love and salvation of Christ. So that was kind of returning to the original idealism of Christianity. So if St. Francis of Assisi is the ideal type of Christian, the great Christian leader has more typically been a Bishop Ambrose, a St. Bernard, a Pope Innocent III, a Luther, a St. Ignatius Loyola, a soldier of the cross. The basically different ethos of Western Christendom is most conspicuous in the American way of life. You cannot serve God and mammon, Jesus said flatly, but Americans believe that they can serve both in their land of opportunity and are very proud of their high standard of living. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek, the humble, but the American is supposed, first of all, to be self-reliant, enterprising, and ambitious. Resist not evil and turn the other cheek. But the great national heroes were the leaders in the War of Independence, the war to preserve union, and the world wars to make the world safe for democracy. Love your enemies. And who tried to love Hitler? The American way can be pretty gross and self-righteous. At its best, however, it is the way of resolute, high-minded, heroic endeavor to oppose tyranny and to extend the blessings of liberty. If the way of Jesus is sublime, it is not necessarily the only good way, or under all circumstances the best way. But the first, I love this sentence, the first prerequisite of morality is to be clear-eyed and honest, to know what one does believe, and to assume the responsibilities of that belief. The chief objection to the pure Christian ideal is that in practice it has produced a basic dishonesty, which is the more dangerous because it is usually unconscious. 
also fateful in its consequences for historic Christianity was the indifference of Jesus to anything but the kingdom of God, however he conceived it. He was not a social or political reformer. Although Shaw and many others have tried to make him out as an apostle of socialism, he was as unconcerned about economic opportunity and political freedom as he was about the cultivation of art, philosophy, and science. His failure to protest against slavery is typical of his failure to draw out the social implications of his call for universal brotherhood and his scorn for the wealthy. His followers developed a more positive indifference to these implications. Until the last century, the leaders of Christendom preferred to take seriously the scattered texts in which Jesus offered comfort to the privileged and powerful, notably his injunction to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The historic church tolerated slavery and serfdom, supported the divine right of kings to govern wrongly, and generally opposed the popular movements towards equality, fraternity, and liberty. The early champions of democracy were often hostile to orthodox religion for the same reason that the leaders of the Russian and Mexican revolutions were hostile. Official Christianity was on the other side. Such perversions are the inevitable byproducts of a revolutionary doctrine that becomes orthodox and are not to be blamed on Jesus himself. His basic teaching was a gospel of love whose plain meaning has survived all perversion and whose implications we still keep returning to as we follow Christian history. We may even see a kind of relativism in his categorical injunctions to judge not and love one's enemies. For as Reinhold Niebuhr points out, these injunctions imply the inevitable fallibility of all human judgment and the finiteness of all social standards of good and evil. Meanwhile, the basic paradox remains that the historic Jesus, so far as we can know him, was not directly responsible for either the success or the failure of Christianity. When he was resurrected, he was indeed transfigured by his followers. He became the Christ, a Greek word he was unacquainted with. He was sent abroad to strange peoples to compete with their mythical savior gods in a similar mystery of the Mass. He was made to demand rights about which he had carried little, and beliefs about which he had known nothing. He was identified with a logos that he had never heard of, and could not have conceived. As a savior, he became the symbol of hopes both grander and meaner than his own. And he remains a profoundly ambiguous symbol. He became ambiguous in his simplest, most familiar aspect, the grand and awful symbol of Jesus nailed to the cross, which adorns his churches everywhere. It was this martyrdom, the example more than the teaching, that enabled Christianity to survive persecution, since his disciples were willing or even eager to follow the example of their Lord. Their passion, however, had its naive aspects. Unhappy men, exclaimed the proconsul Antoninus, If you are thus weary of your lives, is it so difficult for you to find ropes and precipices? More gravely, Marcus Aurelius deplored the unseemly joy with which Christians face the prospect of release from their earthly duties and sought an immediate heavenly reward. So in other words, the image of Christ on the cross inspired the early Christians to embrace the, the persecution against them. And in so doing, in a sense, they became an inspirational people and they carried on an inspirational message that the historical Jesus apparently, you know, did not really, well, as far as we know, did not intend. And, you know, perhaps also insp- finally inspired the the uh, the Roman um, Kaisers, Caesars, to, you know, they tired of prosec- persecuting the Jews, uh, uh, the Christians who embraced it so fully. And so perhaps this is part of the reason that um, the Roman Empire eventually made Christianity its, its base religion. Okay, <clears throat> the inspired followers of Christ had been eager to suffer mar- martyrdom. 
and later on they were eager to inflict it. Jesus on the cross became the symbol of an uncompromising, ruthless idealism that has been in, that has inspired the most, most glorious and most terrible deeds in our history. In the name of one who preached peace and the brotherhood of men, Christians have slaughtered millions of their brethren, chiefly their fellow Christians. Any serious attempt to remove the present causes of war, concludes FSC Northrop, must concentrate on the roots of the Christians, of the Christian religion, and of Western idealism. Any serious attempt to remove the present causes of war must concentrate on the roots of the Christian religion and of Western idealism. And that is the end of the part that deals directly with the historical Christ. And the next part, which I won't read, has to do with the mission of St. Paul. Anyway, I found that an enjoyable read. Very dense and full of provocative thoughts and information. And that's it. Wishing you all a Merry Christmas. for many centuries to come and may Christmas and may Christianity evolve into something better than it is today.